tighten up leaders, welcome to the Nuts and Bolts of Leadership, the show that drills into the foundations of what leadership is all about. I'm your producer and co-host, Haley Gibson. And I'm your host, Billy Durant. Join us as we sit down with leaders from across the country to mine for nuggets of wisdom. All right, everyone, welcome into the meeting room. Today, we're going to be talking about leadership because this is the Nuts and Bolts of Leadership podcast. I'm the host, Billy Duran, and uh, I want to welcome into our studio, Haley Gibson, our producer and co-host. Haley, welcome back to the meeting room. Great to be here. We got a great guest today. Andy Potter is going to be with us. Andy's the president and CEO of Atlas Precision Consulting. Andy and his team have built a dynamic force in leveraging technology to bring solutions to supply chain, manufacturing, and distribution logistics, ultimately to drive high-performance organizations towards increased profits. Andy, welcome to the podcast. Hey, thanks a lot. I appreciate you having me on. Andy's been working with our team. Uh, Andy, you told me it was five years. It seems like it's been a lot longer than that. And I wanted, I want you to take that as a compliment. Not only has Andy uh, become a valuable technology consultant, uh, but Andy's helping us build a sustainable tr- strategic model for our tech ops team. But, you know, I, I'm, one of the things I love about Andy, he's, he's not just a, uh, can I say techno nerd on the podcast? Can I say that? Haley, I would. I would it, it's it's accurate. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I said I would. Accurate. I would rely on the uh, actual technologically I'm, savvy person. In the I'm room telling you, this this you. this dude has got game. <laughs> I'm just telling you, he's got serious game. And uh, when it comes to our the technology and the platform that we're using at Threaded Fasters, I mean, he has been an incredible resource for our company. And uh, Andy, if if you wouldn't make wouldn't mind, just sort of give us a little breakdown of what Atlas Precision. Uh, does for our audience and tell us a little bit of how you got started and what your vision is for your organization. Sure. Yeah. Well, I appreciate the intro. We, we started the company, I guess, late in 2017. Uh, but then it, it really kind of took off in 2018. And what, what we do is we're, we're tool builders. So we work primarily with a system called Profit 21, which is an ERP system that a lot of people in the industrial distribution space use. Uh, but also some manufacturing and, and things like that. Um, what we do is try to help our customers find solutions to make P21 do something that they need it to do, but it doesn't already do. Or we try to help them with automation or integration or things like that, where we're just helping our clients get the max benefit they can out of probably the largest technology investment they'll ever make. So Andy, where, so how did you come on this niche? So you, you, you saw the need and then you just, I, I know that you begin working within an organization, but then you saw the need. I mean, it just continues to grow and grow and grow. And, and I know your company is, is blown up exponentially. So, so how did, how has you experienced the growth that you have? So I was working for a distributor and manufacturer and they were also on profit 21 and I got to know the system really well. And it just so happened to be based on two technologies that I had a pretty deep background in with database and then just the the front end of it. And so it was a system I was able to catch on to really, really quickly. And we started doing a lot of projects to try to make things better. And as I got out into the community, I started to see, wow, there's, there's a lot of people that are having the same struggles and a lot of issues that they're having a hard time getting where they want to go with the system. Where I was, I had the budget and I had everything that I needed to be able to get whatever I needed to make the system do what I wanted it to do. But as I started looking at the market, I'm like, gosh, there's so many other companies that don't have those resources or assets to be able to just say, hey, we're going to do this. So we're doing it. And so to me, there seemed like there was a business plan somewhere in there. And I started working on it and just felt like, I don't know, I just kind of felt like, okay, this is what I was meant to do. This is the company I was meant to start. And and it just kind of took off from there. We started off on day one when I was doing it full time. I think we had five customers. Now we have 125 to 150. I, I don't even know anymore. I've lost count. It was just me with my daughter helping me part time. Now there's 11 of us. I mean, it's it's crazy how fast it's grown in such a short period of time. 
And it's an incredible story. And, and I, I'll tell you, I'm, I'll, I'll be one of those people that's the, the, one of the happy days of our lives, our company's existence was the day that you went into business, um, because you've been such a huge resource to us. And, uh, what, Haley, what's really interesting about Andy is it's not just the computer side. He understands the business. He understands the model. So, so Andy, you know, even in your bio, you, you talk about, and, you know, this is what the nuts and bolts of leadership podcast is all about. Is talking about actually what leadership looks like. And in, in your bio, you talk about you help companies see the 50,000 foot view. So, so explain to, to our audiences, you know, what does that mean? And then, then maybe what does that mean for individuals kind of seeing the bigger picture? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I mean, I've been in and around industry for, I think, 27 or 28 years now. And a recurring theme that I see is, is for a lot of companies, it's really easy to get hung up in like the minutia and the finer details and then lose sight of the ultimate goal. So like I said before, for our customers, in a lot of cases, we're tool builders and we do really intricate things. A lot of times we're working in and around a customer's competitive advantage and we're trying to help them get the most out of that advantage. And so when we're doing that, I think it's really important to make sure that we understand and have some amount of focus on the end game and not, you know, just solely be focused on the mechanics of, oh, this project is supposed to do this. Well, we could build something completely to spec, but if it's not getting you to the end game, then we built the wrong thing, even if that's what we all agreed needed to be built. And so that's where we try to be a little bit different and help our customers figure out, hey, what are we really trying to do? How do we maximize the benefit? I think, especially maybe in the last 10 years, it feels like it's getting a lot harder for management teams to to do that. And I think that is particularly true in a case where you have an ownership structure or a board structure that they're looking at progress in terms of like quarters or maybe even months. And and Billy, you know, I mean, in, in that short time frame, you can't do anything big and meaningful and impactful. It's just it's just not possible. And I think that's one of the the sad pitfalls of companies getting hung up on creating shareholder value and not really focusing on, hey, we need to actually make our company better, not for this quarter's perform, uh, excuse me, not for this quarter's performance, but for ten years from now. And I, I don't know. It's just kind of the way I, that it's played out in, in my career. And it's tough. So so when you when you find that when you're, when you're meeting with an organization that, that may uh, begin to that you, obviously you're catching on to something very quickly that, you know, they're looking for a short term gain here. They're not really interested in committing to the process. I think that would be. You know, one of the things that we talk about a lot is is the process. It's not an event. It's in a process. It's something that is for for our company. And we talk about this often. We're building the perpetual model. We're building the model that goes on forever. So sometimes the short term gain is a little harder to see. So how are you communicating that, though, to those leaders? I mean, what what is some of the ways that you talk to them about that? How And, and are there some that you just can't get there and maybe you just have to move on? Well, the second part of that question is easy. Yes. I mean, there's absolutely situations where we get into it and we, we can't see a, a scenario where we're going to create any value. We're going to run up a bill, but that's about it. And I have never had a problem having a, a very frank conversation with a customer and just saying, look, I don't think we're the right fit for you. Here's five other companies that might be a better fit. But this is what we do. This is how we work. I've got 150 customers and I can't change my model so that I can take on customer number 151. And I just had that conversation last week and, and it's tough and nobody likes it. I didn't like that one because it was with somebody that I've known for 10 years, but it just wasn't going to work. And and so, so yeah, you have to be prepared for that. And then you're going to have to Give me the first part of the question again, because I got completely caught up in the second part. Well, well, I think that is just that. I think that is is how quickly you can recognize, and I mean, you've been doing this for a while, how, how quickly you can recognize this is not going in a way that's going to suit us as being partners. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So yeah, it's it's really just about trying to uncover what their goals are. And and if they're if they're very abstract or they are conflicting goals, it's like Okay, we want to have 99% customer service levels out of our inventory 
and we want our inventory to turn 10 times. Well, unless you have an unbelievably world-class supply chain, and I have yet to see one, and it's not going to happen. It's just those those two goals inherently conflict with each other. And so it's one of those where when you start to hear things, I mean, you know, in any business relationship and any project you're trying to take on, the cracks in the walls show up early. And it's just a question as to whether or not you're honest about that and recognize it and say, this is going the wrong direction really quick. And for us, I would rather pull the ripcord sooner rather than later and just be up front with the client and say, look, we're not going to get you there. And here's why. And sometimes they take it well and sometimes they don't. Yeah. And I think there's a really cool, this is kind of one of those nuggets and we're, we're looking for those wisdom nuggets, Andy, and I'm already picking this up already that, you know, sometimes it's being committed to your process, committed to your model and look, sometimes we're just not a good fit. I mean, I would say that we've got clients that we have had to say, you know, this is just not a good partnership for us. You know, we want to create win-wins and this is one-sided and uh, and, and it's just not going to work for us. So I, I appreciate you saying that there are times when in a leader's role, particularly in business owner's role, you have to make a decision, those tough decisions on firing or not entering into agreements with particular clients. So, so, so Andy, you know, you've, you've had such an extremely diverse and robust career, including, by the way, uh, serving in the U.S. military. So thank you for your service. How has all of this that you've been through impacted your leadership journey? Oh, gosh. Well, where the military is concerned, I, I can think of two things off the top of my head. One of them kind of came into play after I was already out, but you and I have talked about it once before. But the first one really is is this, it's crazy, but it's this thing called the five paragraph op order or five paragraph operations order. And what it is, is it's a template that is used by commanders to, at all levels, to develop and communicate the mission plan to a group of soldiers. So one's done at the battalion level that goes down to the company, the company commander does one that goes down to the platoon level and so on and so forth. But it covers like everything. Situation, what do we know about the enemy? How are we going to communicate? Where are we going to get support? Really detailed stuff. But there's one section in there that, in my opinion, is the most important thing. It's uh, under the second part of, of the order called execution. It's called commander's intent. And this is the part of the op order that even in an organization as regimented and structured as the U.S. military is... This is the part that tells you what's the overall goal. What are we trying to do here? And the reason that that exists is so that if and when the rest of this plan falls apart, you know what you're really trying to accomplish. And and I think that's valuable, not just in the military, but in business and in life in general. You need to know what the goal is because every plan is going to fall apart to one degree or another. Like all of the assumptions you made, some of them are going to pan out. Some of them aren't. I mean, there's there's so many examples of people having sayings about it. You know, one is like the plan goes out the window as soon as you snap the ball. Or uh, I think Mike Tyson had one that says everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. You know, that that kind of thing. And so that's where your commander's intent comes in. And it's designed to say, look, apart from everything else in here, that's what we're trying to achieve. So whatever you have to do to adapt and overcome and all of that that's what you need to do and that's where we're trying to go so i i've always really thought a, a lot about that and i try to use that that concept as much as possible the other one happened oh probably 15 years after i got out of the military and i was listening to two speeches by two different speakers and i think it was two or three years apart that i heard these two speeches one was from a, a guy named jimmy blackman uh, i think he was a colonel uh, in the army and probably going to misstate this, but I think he was a commander in the air cavalry, I think. But anyway, he worked for general David Petraeus and this is Iraq and Afghanistan and, and all this kind of stuff. And he gave this whole speech talking about principles of strategic leadership. And it was really good. It was very impactful. I really enjoyed it. And then lo and behold, two or three years later, I'm at an Epicor conference, which is, you know, software and tech Petraeus is the uh, general Petraeus is the keynote speaker. 
and he gives a talk on principles of strategic leadership. And the two speeches are like, it was like listening to the same speech twice. So this is one from the general and one from a colonel that worked for him. And it's the same thing. Now that right there tells you how effective General Petraeus was at communicating his intents and his belief and, and all of that, because you have a commander and a subordinate commander that are in a hundred percent lockstep on what's key to strategic leadership. And, and Andy, first of all, I thought the exact same thing, Mike Tyson. I thought that I was, when you were saying that example, I was thinking the same thing. Everything goes out the window the first time you get punched in the face. But, but I will say this, it sounds, yeah. it sounds kind of like our mission. So, so your, your overall goal, our overall mission, our mission statement at Threat of Faster is to create value in and for the people we serve. That way we can lay this question before anything that comes toward us or if something falls apart we can always go back to what is the value proposition if our mission is to create value what is the mission proposition here so i mean the, the value proposition and and i appreciate you saying that because that that really is very interesting how we can always go back to when the bullets start flying when you get punched in the nose whatever the case may be you know, when things start coming apart, go back to the mission. Um, that, that I think that's so that's huge for us to to get as leaders is making sure that everybody understands the overall goal or the overall mission of the organization. So uh, Haley had a question for you, Andy. Yeah, for those nugget watchers, I think we could. Can we call them nugget watchers? Yeah. The people who are yeah. you know listening just to get all of the nuggets. Yeah. Uh, that commander's intent piece. I mean, when you said that, uh, Billy speaks a lot about how our mission has to be driven from the top. If it's not driven from the top, then there there is no mission because there has to be a singular goal in mind. And if you have too many people that are trying to have all of their different goals be the priority, then you really don't have a goal at all. And so that speaks to that executive level, that, that um, executive level leadership in knowing what the true issues are, what the true goals are. And so you have had executive level, level leadership. So what are the business benefits of understanding the issues at that executive level and how you can kind of merge that with a business first approach? I think the biggest benefit is it really helps me put things into context very, very quickly. So if you've worked at that level and you you understand how different things in a business tie together, it helps you ask much better questions much more quickly. So like inventory is a really good example of that. You sit down to engage with somebody and they're like, well, we need more inventory. Okay. The first thing that goes through my mind is, I wonder if they're willing to make the cash commitment or if they even can make the cash commitment to having more inventory because those two things are irrevocably tied to each other. For most distributors, inventory is the largest asset on their balance sheet. And when you start getting into a million, you know, or a hundred million dollars worth of inventory, a two or three percent sway either direction can make a huge dent in cash flow. Another good example would be like pricing and margin. So if I'm in any time I'm in that conversation where we're talking pricing and margin, my wheels are turning in the background thinking about each decision that's being discussed and what that's going to do to the P&L and what's going, what that's also going to do to cash flow. So like most of the people that I've worked in and around, they don't intuitively associate gross profit, gain or loss with its direct tie to net profit. So real simple example. If you're going to sell something for ten dollars and it costs you five, you're going to make five dollars, and then you pay out all your all your expenses and everything. And maybe at the bottom of all of that, you've made one dollar after all your overhead and everything, right? If I do the same exact transaction and sell it for eleven dollars, my net profit doubles from a dollar to two dollars. And I think that's where working at the executive level and working at the you know, looking at the financials and looking at how every decision ties back into those financial statements, that has been a really big help. And then another thing I think that it has been the biggest benefit really, when I really sit and think about it is working at the executive level in a few different roles. So I haven't always done the same thing. It cemented my opinion that managing cash is probably the single most important thing you can do in a business. 
most of the businesses that I see, they are very P&L or income statement driven. Uh, a few of them have been balance sheet driven, which is good, but I don't, I don't think I could name five that were cash flow driven. And for me, when I look at the way any business I've worked in and even my own, the way that they operate, if I'm growing cash, my balance sheet's probably okay. And if my balance sheet's okay, my P&L is probably okay. And at that point, those become diagnostic tools to just work around the edges. But number one for me is, is growing cash because if you're bleeding cash, you can only do that for a period of time and then you're closing your doors. And the only thing that your margin or your P&L is going to do for you in that situation is just determine the timing of when you're going out of business. Because that's your main resource. If you want to stay in the game, if you want to keep playing, you have to have the resources to do it. And cash is the number one resource to do it. Yeah. And cash is always in style and it, it never really goes out of style. So when we, uh, when we focus on cash flow, it, it, it goes with everything we wear. So, uh, we're, we're always going to focus on, uh, what we can't lose sight of that cash flow. And, and Andy, it's, it's interesting talking about the executive level and connecting, you know, your executive level experience when you're speaking to business owners about their technology and how the technology can impact their business. You can answer the why behind it. it it's not just about what we're going to do for you. It's going to do why, why technology is so important. Why efficiencies are so important. Why building like at our organization, you've helped us create, you know, bandwidth in our tech ops team, which is, you know, merging technology and operations. And that's something that, you know, um, Jared and, and, you know, our COO is, is huge on, you know, merging the technology and our operations to create efficiencies. And uh, so, Andy, when we come back, we're going to talk about the difference possibly in leading a technology organization from what it would be like to just a, an organization that might not be so heavily focused in technology. So we're visiting today with Andy Podner. He is the CEO of Atlas Precision Consulting. This is the Nuts and Bolts of Leadership podcast, and we'll be right back. Threaded Fasteners is a 100% employee-owned company whose mission is to create value in and for the people we serve. So if you're interested in learning more about how we develop a people-centric culture, or if you're interested in a customized fastener solution, send us an email at culture at threadedfasteners.com. That's culture at threadedfasteners.com. All right, everyone, welcome back to the meeting room. Uh, today we're in the room with uh, Andy Podner. He is the CEO of Atlas Precision, and we've been talking about technology and his experience. And uh, uh, Andy, you have some great uh, examples of some military leaders that have made an impact on your life. And, and several months ago, you and I were talking about the strategic thinking model, and, and you actually sent me a YouTube presentation, and I love David Petraeus's uh, take on this uh, four task of strategic thinking, get the big ideas right, communicate the big ideas, implement the big ideas. And the one that I found very interesting, the last one was kind of refine and adjust. So, you know, as we create and communicate goals to our team, I think part of the communication model is that sometimes once the once things get underway, there has to be some refining and adjustment. So, so how have you um, uh, been doing this at Alice Precision? How do you make adjustments with your team goals? The the obvious answer to the importance of making adjustments is you know it makes your good ideas better. I mean that's that's easy, but I think there's there's a deeper answer behind it, and that's. Like if you force yourself to go through these refinements, the other thing you're going to end up forcing yourself to do is, is drop the whole concept of pride of ownership. So you've got to be willing and determined to fail at something as quickly as you possibly can. So if you're in the middle of something and it turns out to be not a great idea or the implementation of it is not good, you got to be able to admit that as quick as you can. And then either you fix it or you just drop it, move on to something else. Because a lot of times what ends up happening is inertia keeps a bad idea alive because there's this perception that, well, the boss wants it, or, hey, we've already invested a lot into this. Well, it doesn't matter. If it's not working, it's never it's it's not working. You just have to be able to, to do that. And so I, the example I can give you from our business is I had this idea, oh, gosh, maybe in 2021, 20, 
And we went down this path of really trying to develop a suite of cloud-based services. And so this is like, you know, being able to do hosting and manage infrastructure and things that a traditional managed service provider might do. We got about six months in, we were establishing partnerships for telephony and, you know, hardware and all this kind of stuff. And we got about six months in and, and realized, hey, we're actually not very good at this. This is not within our skill set. We, we don't really know how to do it. And either we're going to have to go hire a bunch of folks or we're going to have to drop it because this is not how our customers see us in this market. And when I looked at it, I said, that's it. We got to get out of this before it saps any more of our resources or worse. We're actually moderately successful at it. And now we're, we're in a position where we've taken on long-term contracts for something that we really aren't that passionate about, it turns out. And now we're stuck with it for the next three to five years. But the good news is we ended up learning something along the way. And that was that cloud-based integrations and software development, that's something that we were actually really good at. And it had a practical application within our customer base. So the whole thing wasn't a total loss. We ended up coming up with some really great stuff out of it. But had we just said, well, we're pressing forward no matter what, I don't know where we would be. Yeah, and oftentimes, Andy, we, what we what we found out is it takes courage to say we're not good at this. I mean, that, that's courageous to say, look, we're, we're not good at this. And for leaders to recognize that and then lean into it and say, look, this, we, we need to adjust. And I actually love that actually that, that, uh, Petraeus puts that at the end as the fourth idea. Sometimes you have to refine and adjust, recognize we're not good at this and then have the courage to call it out in front of your team. So, um, we, we want to ask you some questions about the, the technology type business. Uh, Billy and I were actually okay. just talking about this a little bit before the break about kind of, Technology scares people a little bit, <laughs> scares Billy a little bit. Honestly, it scares me a little bit, too. I think people look at millennials and Gen Z as in, you know, we grew up in this technological age. I mean, we, we grew up with computers. We grew up with cell phones. But that's only, you know, you only know what you use every day. You really don't know how it works or or how to use it over over a large scope of different means but i guess my my question is um does leading a technology technology organization that kind of a, a part of your goal is education how do you present a unique challenge not found by other companies i'm probably going to surprise you with this answer i don't think it's that different you said millennials and, and gen z and all that so that's like that's an immutable characteristic right you don't get to pick the generation you were born in right so i i, I tend to not look at people in those buckets. I can't put you in a bucket over something that you can't control. So what we're what we're looking at is trying to and this is not just for technology. For me it's just about people. Do the people that I'm working with have both the capability and the desire to be successful at whatever they're trying to do. And you got to have both. You can be extremely capable but have no desire you're not getting off square one. And the reverse can be through. You could you could bleed Atlas, but not have the capability. You're still not getting off square one. And so if you have if you can find people that you can trust, that they share your core values, and they are completely bought into your vision, your culture, that's how you're gonna win. And when when I hire I'm looking actually really hard at culture fit. I think my team, anyone on my team would tell you that my favorite saying is, look, I can teach you how to code. I can teach you how to work on a computer system. The thing that I can't teach you, I cannot teach you how to not be a jerk. And I, I'm not a psychologist and I don't want to be a psychologist. Nothing against them. It's It's a great profession. I just have no interest in it. I just want to surround myself with people that that want to do the same thing that I want to do. And so yeah, I'm doing tech right now and construction. And I'd done construction once before. I've done distribution. I've done manufacturing. And if I look back at it, and I'm really honest with myself, it's the people and the culture of the company that really separates the great companies from the ones that are just okay. 
And, and I don't think that that's like this unique revelation for me. I think you could see that anywhere. I mean, it wouldn't be hard if we wanted to have a quiz on which fast food chains do you think value people and culture over other ones or which airline, right? Everybody could probably come up with very similar answers. So I, I really just truly believe, yeah, you're hiring for different skill sets, but at the end of the day, what it, it's really just about the people that you're you're bringing in. I'm, I'm gonna love that. I love that you talk about culture because we talk about culture a lot, and you know we we want to make sure that in the nuts and bolts of leadership podcast, culture is always a feature on the podcast, and and it and it's interesting how you have identified it. Really doesn't mat- matter what business you're in. It doesn't matter if you're in the technology side of business or the distribution or manufacturing. It's all about the. It comes down to the people. And the culture of a healthy, strong organization. So, so Andy, uh, we want to be a good steward of your time, and, and we're kind of winding this down a little bit. You know, two, this is kind of a two-part question. Um, if, if we were interviewing someone or we grabbed someone off your team, how would they describe your leadership style? And then secondly, how has it evolved over the last five years or so? So, so the leader you are today compared to say the leader you were five, 10 years ago, what would you say your leadership style is today? And then how has it evolved? Well, I think bar none, the toughest thing that I've had in, in my leadership journey, and I, and I do believe that it's a journey. It's not a destination I'm ever going to get to is letting go. So this is like, I'm five years into this company and this has been the first year that I have not really been involved in every operational aspect of the business. And if you want to scale up, you got to be realistic that you cannot physically or mentally do it all. It's, It's not possible. And so the biggest realization with that was telling myself, you know, if you really believe you have the right team on the bus, then why aren't you letting them just run with it? And if you don't trust them, then why did you hire them? So now I have this like, CEO's paradox running between my ears, right? You can't have you can't have it both ways. And and that's what you figure out that this problem is in your own head and you just need to get over it. And so I've I've done some things that have forcibly taken me out of the front lines for weeks and almost a month um uh, here recently. And it's amazing. The the team they're growing, they're they're exceeding any expectation I could have ever had. Um, and side bonus, I have a life outside of the company that, yeah, I don't think I've ever had. So that, that's that been really nice. And and as far as what they would say, my hope is that I've communicated it well enough to our people that my primary function in this company is to, A, develop and protect the company culture. You know, coming back to culture, I think you and I agree on that. That's really important. But then B, my job is to clear roadblocks. And I could tell, at least to myself, I felt like I was getting better at my job when I started to see that my daily routine really started becoming about mostly talking to and working with members of my team, helping them solve their problems, looking at different ways to get things done. I still communicate with customers, but not in the same way that I used to. Now it's like, hey, we we really want to talk about the big stuff and and I don't have to be involved in in all the minutia and and it's not healthy if I am because I mean Billy you know in your role and my role the things that you say they carry a lot of weight and people can get hung up on them when really you were just kind of saying like off the top of your head well this is what I would do and then all of a sudden that becomes like chiseled into a stone tablet when that's not really what you meant in the first place so Beyond that, I think you just have to pull one of them aside and ask them, you know, I, I don't know. I hope that's what I got done, but, uh, you know, that's that's where I'm at. Well, let me tell you a couple of things that I heard. Firstly, you know, if you're if you're uh, admittedly, it sounded like you're you're a person who thinks out loud. <laughs> Careful how you think out loud. They take it and run and chisel on stone. I get that. I've experienced that. Uh, we've we've opened up several several different branches when I've just thought about maybe it would be a good idea to have a branch here. Next thing I know, we're you know we're uh, we're we're putting up a sign outside. But th- there are times we have to be careful. But let, let me tell you what I appreciate about what you just said. There's a lot of transparency, a lot of vulnerability in what you just said. First of all, you recognize that in order for this thing to grow, I can't hold on to it too tight, and 
I think that's great wisdom for business owners. I think that's great wisdom for those who are trying to micromanage. We're actually having some training going on this very day on micro and macro management leadership style on, you know, what it is to let your team to lead others, you know, to accomplish goals through others. That That's part of the training that's going on actually today uh, that Jared's doing with some of our team members. Um, but I appreciate you admitting that, you know, now, now that you've seen how putting people into place has allowed you to grow and expand and, you know, look back and say, Hey, I've got the right people on the bus so that you can work on your business, not in your business. And that's what your role has become. You're working more on the business instead of in the business. And that's what the fruit you're beginning to see and how you, your company has just blown up. So, Andy, the last question, and, and we, we ask this of every leader that comes on the show with us. If we had an emerging leader in the meeting room with us today and they're just kind of wondering, how do I get started? What can I do today to enhance my leadership journey? What advice would you have for them? So I started a YouTube channel. Since we're talking about young leaders, I'm going to try to make this relatable to, to the younger generation, Haley, just just you know, millennials and Gen Z. I started a YouTube channel for our construction business. I, I, it's not even been three months ago. So we're really just getting our feet up under us and, and trying to figure all of that out. But one of the big things that you pick up on really quickly when you start watching tutorials about how to start a channel and, and do all these things, one of the recurring things that you hear is at some point, you just have to hit record and start uploading. And I think that's pretty sage advice for leadership and for life. Get comfortable with the fact that you're going to make some mistakes. I know I have. You're going to struggle. You're not always or maybe even ever going to know where exactly to start or how exactly it's going to turn out. But if you think you know what success looks like, then just get up and start doing it. You know, this organization, there's 11 of us. So I've worked in organizations where I had over 200 people under my authority or, or whatever you want to call it. I don't even like that word. And in all of that time, I don't remember ever telling someone, hey, you're being a little too much of a go-getter. Stop leading so much. I've never had to have that conversation. So I think the other thing that I think is important about being a leader, and I think Simon Sinek nailed this when he said, being a leader is not about being in charge. It's about taking care of the people in your charge. And I think if you keep that in mind, you know, my my job is to take care of these folks so that they can do their job and then everyone wins if we do that. I, that to me, those are important. You know, be authentic, be clear, um, but but take care of your people. That's that's key. Very good. Andy, I can't tell you how much I appreciate it, uh, spending time with us. We've been, uh, in, on the podcast today with Andy Podner. He is the CEO of Atlas Precision Consulting. Andy, thanks for taking time with us on the podcast today. Absolutely. Appreciate you having me. All right. Haley and I'll be right back with a few closing comments. Man, that's an awesome interview with Andy Podner. Um, Andy has got such a unique uh, perspective in leadership. I, I think his um, him speaking about the military service and how he kept tying that into uh, leadership development. I love the, the the fact that we paused into that refine and adjust. And and he talked about you know they actually had an opportunity to go into a, a segment of business. They figured out they weren't very good at it. They, affine, they refine and adjusted their plan. So great leadership nugget from Andy Podner. Mm -hmm. I, I love the piece that he said about very early on on a project, you're going to be able to find those cracks in the wall. And I know you talked about, you know, the good, good is the enemy of great. But sometimes, you know, when we speak about those uh, projects, we sometimes you just have to start. I mean, the podcast is one of these things. We didn't think that we were going to do our first podcast and it was going to be the greatest podcast that we ever did. But we did know that at some point you just have to say, okay, let's start and then we'll fix the cracks in the walls later. I actually was surprised by his answer on is running a technology organization different than running, you know, any other business. And he, and he said, no, I mean, I, I can't imagine, I guess because I just know so little about, I'm so technology challenged is probably what, what where my hang up there is. But it was interesting in, in listening to him walk through the similarities in running that businesses are way more similar than they are different. So great episode with Andy Podner, and we'll look forward to being back with you on the nuts and bolts of leadership podcast uh, real soon. So until then, Haley, tighten up, tighten up. <laughs> 
Thank you for joining the Nuts and Bolts of Leadership podcast, brought to you by the employee owners of Threaded Fasteners. If you enjoyed our conversation, please subscribe to, rate, and review the Nuts and Bolts of Leadership wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Do you have a leadership story to tell or a question to ask? Email us at podcast at threadedfasteners.com. That's podcast at threadedfasteners.com. This show is made possible by our family at Threaded Fasteners, Inc. Our mission is to create value in and for the people we serve. Interested in learning more about TFI and how we create value in our team, in our communities, and in our customers? Visit threadedfasteners.com. Thank you again for listening. I'm your co-host and producer, Haley Gibson. And I'm your host, Billy Durant. This show is edited and produced by Johnny Glenn and our friends at Deep Fried Studios.